Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Piyush and this is video number 15th in the series Azure DevOps Zero to Hero. This video is all about security best practices in Azure DevOps and the best practices overall. And this is not just important from learning point of view, but from interview perspective as well. So these are the best practices that's been asked a lot of times in interviews and like every Azure DevOps user administrator, they should know all of these things. Right. So without any further ado, let me take you to the GitHub repository and we'll have a look at all the topics that we'll be discussing and then we'll look into that in detail. So let's head over to it. Okay. So uh, I am in my GitHub repository. Link is there in the description section and in the comment section as well. So I have scrolled down to the section where it says day 15 Azure DevOps security best practices. And this particular video is divided into nine different section because we will be covering nine of these topics. The first one is Azure DevOps access control, then organization settings, agent pool management, pipeline settings, project level settings, pipeline security, repo settings, authentication and authorization, and last but not the least secrets and credential access. So let's start with the first one, which is Azure DevOps access control. So here is my Azure DevOps organization and I'm going to go to organization settings. All right. So on the left side, you would see an option called Microsoft Entra. So do not worry. This is not something that was newly introduced. It was just rebranded earlier. It used to call Azure Active Directory. I'm sure you have heard that before. This is the same thing. They have just, you know, rebranded it with a new name. And this is the preferred method of how you would connect to your Azure DevOps organization because it has several advantages. So the way you do it, you hit over here, which says connect directory. Right? And then you select your directory. Uh, let's say random sync or default directory. I'm going to go with default directory. And then it will say that some of the members of this organization will lose the access because they are not part of uh, that default directory, right? So I will accept that and I will hit connect. It now it will again ask my confirmation because it will sign me out of this Azure DevOps organization. So let's hit sign out. Okay. And if we go to our Microsoft Azure and over here, uh, you can search Microsoft Entra or Entra ID. Click on that. On the left side, you would see users, group, external identities, rules and administrator and a lot of other things. So if you click on users, there'll be a default user created for you when you have created your account. So this is the default user in the Microsoft account identity. What we can do is we can create a new user by clicking over here. So this new user can be in your default directory. If you click on that, right, you just give this a name. Let's call it test. And the user principal name of this user will be test at the rate. You says they were 2000 gmail dot on Microsoft dot com because this is the default directory domain name. And if you don't want to create the user in that, what you can do is you can go back. Let me discard this and go to users and new user and hit invite external user. Now what you can do is you can enter your email over here. Right. And you can give this a message. Let's call it test. Hit next properties. If you want to enter any other details like street address, uh, employee ID, confidential detail and anything else, then you can do that. I'll hit next assignment and over here you can add role or you can add group. Right? Let's add a role. Let's use the role of Azure DevOps administrator so that I would have access to manage all the organizational policies and settings. So I'll select that and hit select. Okay, next review and invite, verify everything and hit invite. Once you do that, you will receive an email. I'm going to pause the recording and accept the invite from that email. And it says role could not be added. Why is that? So let's hit refresh. Okay. Let me try to sign in with that user. Sign in. 
okay state sign in and i do have access to that and it says this is the default directory and my org is connected to the default directory and i am logged in with my user because i have access to that user and i'm able to access this organization because i have invited myself as an external user to the organization otherwise i wouldn't have access to it right so there are these different ways you can do that so once you are logged in you verify the entra settings over here and these are nothing but the organizational policies that you can manage other benefits of using microsoft entra id is to have a single pane of glass for the identity you don't have to manage your users from multiple places like from Azure portal, from Azure DevOps separately. You can do that from Azure portal itself with the help of Entra ID service and the changes will be reflected in Azure DevOps. For example, if a user leaves the organization, you just have to remove that user from the Entra ID from Azure portal and the changes will be reflected over here as well. So that's that's one of the important benefit of using Entra ID and not just users, your users, group roles, everything will be in sync with Entra ID over here because we have connected the directory, right? So this is a sync that's been created for you. So these are the different settings that you can have a look. For example, restrict organizational creation. That means if it is enabled, no user would be able to create a new organization and you can add the exceptions as well over here add microsoft entra user or group that means if we add some users over here or any group apart from those users or group no one would be able to create a new organization so that's one thing then we have restrict global personal access token creation that means that access token that you are creating it should be associated with the specific azure devops organization it should not have global scope so that is just restricting the permission of PAT. And again, the similar thing, restrict full access, personal access token. That means you should have uh, the customized access. It should have only the access that it needs and should not have more than that. And then enforce maximum personal access token lifespan. Uh, by default, this is 30. So you can change this to any number, depend on your organizational policies. Right. So after those days, the token, the personal access token will be expired and you have to renew it. And if there is a leaked personal access token by enabling this option, it would be automatically revoked. So these are the settings or we can also call them as conditional access policies that is enabled with Microsoft Entra. If this directory was disconnected then these permissions would not be enabled next let's go to uh, we are in the organizational settings still let's go to policies over here okay so if you scroll down like there is an option allow public projects public project will be accessible to outside the organization or outside the user who does not have access and who should not have access to this organization so we should make sure that we disable this option so that only private project would be created, right? So this is really important. Then external guest access. If you want some external guests to be able to uh, sign up to this Azure uh, DevOps organization or should they be able to read have or if uh, they should have the read only access, then you can enable this. But this policy should also be disabled. It's a security risk to allow external guests to have access to your organization unless it is really critical or unless it is required for you know let's say external auditors or few other cases right so it should be disabled so if we go to users over here so these users we have already seen like uh, user should be added with a managed identity or microsoft entra id and if we go down to permissions you will have different set of permissions. Uh, some of them were created by default for you. So these are the different basic groups that were created for you. Right? For example, this project collection administrator. This is a group where your all the organizational admins resides, right? So currently the member is myself plus project collection service account. This is again one of the best practices to make sure you have more than one users as part of the project collection administrator group. This is to, you know, let's say if I leave the organization, then who would have access to it? Or if someone terminates me, 
without any day's notice, then this organization, no one would be able to access and manage. So make sure, I mean, not just for these cases, not just for firing or termination cases, like let's say if organizational admin is on leave, then there should be someone who takes care of his or her activities on, on that person's behalf, right? So that's why it is important to have an additional, uh, maybe one or two people as organizational admin in the absence of the primary admin. So those users should be added over here. So this is permission. Okay, now let's go down to agent pool section. So we have Microsoft hosted agent and agent pool. So if you click on that and go to settings, it says allow agent in the pool to automatically update. It is important for your agents to be updated all the time so that it takes care of all the vulnerabilities or all the security risks that is associated with the older versions, right? And if this is critical, if this particular agent pool is running the production workload, then make sure you enable the agent maintenance job. What it will do is this will upgrade the agent only during the maintenance window so that during the critical time, let's say during business hours, it should not try to update the agents that could impact the ongoing work. So you can uh, set the schedule over here, start maintenance job at this time and run on these, these days. Let's say if you want only it to be run on Saturdays and Sunday, you can select that. And you can set all other options like number of jobs to keep, uh, days to keep unused working directory and so on. This is self-explanatory, so uh, you can have a look at that. But this is really important to set a maintenance job schedule, especially in case when it is serving critical workload. And also you see like there are different agent pools over here. So make sure you segregate your agent pools between critical and non-critical job. You have production, workload should run on a separate agent pool so that it is not impacted with overloading or it is not you know occasionally broken so you have to take extra precautions for that plus uh, these are the azure hosted agent or microsoft hosted agent if you want to have full control over your build servers or you don't want anything to be traversed over the public internet and you know uh, getting data to and fro from Microsoft hosted agent, then you should always, always use self hosted agents. So we already have a video on that. I believe it's video number eight of this series. So you can create an agent pool by clicking over here, self hosted on virtual machine or self hosted on Azure virtual machine scale set. So you can select either of these options and with the help of service connection, you can easily provision the agent. Right? Again, this is when you need full control, let's say you want extra storage, you want extra build cap capabilities, you want uh, a higher memory or CPU spec virtual machine to be run as a build agent, or you want it to be fully available all the time without any latency. In all those cases, you should always go with the self-hosted agent. Now, uh, these all the things we have seen. Now let's go to pipeline settings. Over here, there are a lot of options that you can have a look. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the important ones, which is this one. Disable creation of classic build pipeline. YAML is the preferred way of creating or managing the pipeline because of the so many benefits that it has. Like you can track the changes. It can be maintained in a version control such as a Git repo, Azure repos or GitHub repo, any, any Git based repo. And it can be maintained as a code, you know, with the help of pull request and you can revert the changes and all other features that a Git repo has. So that is why it, it is important to use the YAML based pipeline instead of the classic pipeline. Classic pipeline is OK if you are starting for the first time, you know, just go through it, get your hands dirty with it, just understand how it works and that's it. Then disable this option and never use it again. So YAML pipeline is the way to go. So that's that's one option that you would want to enable. And if you scroll down, yeah, rest of the options you can have a look. It's not uh, that big a deal. Yeah, this one over here, limit variable that can be set at queue time. That means you can only use the variables that are explicitly marked as setable during the view time. So if this option wouldn't be marked, that means you can set any number of variables while creating the build, which will override the existing build variables. So this is a security risk. And if you enable it, then you can take care of it. Like 
how many variables you can set during the build runtime. Okay, I believe uh, these all options. Okay, if you go to repositories, so this we have seen in another video, which was based on uh, Azure Repos Advanced Security. So, but I'll just quickly discuss a few of those. So first, uh, you should enable Advanced Security for new projects. Um, let's go to the home page and then select any project for which you want to make the changes. And on the left side, again, click on project settings. And let's go to the pipeline settings first over here. Okay, over here, you can set the retention policy, like how many days you want to keep artifact, symbol, and attachments. So this could be your build artifacts. This could be your test results and reports. This could be your code coverage report, any artifact that is associated with your pipeline. So you can um, change this option if you want. You can keep days to run, right? How many days you want to keep one pipeline run for? days to keep pull request runs and number of recent runs to retain per pipeline, right? Whatever option you select will decide how much storage will be used by your pipeline because the number of runs that you are retaining, that means all the build artifacts will also be retained with that run. But sometimes for audit and compliance for other purpose, you prefer to have a larger number for this, let's say, you want to retain recent 30 runs for the pipeline. So you can change this option as per your organizational and security requirements. Okay, then go down to repos repository um, and go to settings. Over here, you can enable the advanced security. Again, this we have already seen as part of another video. There is a complete video in this series. I believe it's video number eight, but you can check it out in the same playlist and rest of the options were also discussed in that but let's have a look at few other options for example policies this is a branch policy so anything that you would want to specify for the particular branch you can create a new policy you click on that and protect the default branch for each repository or the current and future branch as per the pattern uh, whatever you would want to select and hit create and once you do that, then you can select the option like require a minimum number of reviewers. So ideally it should be more than one. So you should have at least two reviewer who would review any changes that been merged into the branch, right? And you would want to disable this option. Just keep it disabled, allow a requester to approve their own changes. It's not something very fruitful, right? If someone is making the changes and approving its own change, then it just negate the whole purpose behind the approval, right? So just keep it disabled and you can add this option as well, automatically included reviewers. So click over here, add a new reviewer policy. That means you should add a new reviewer. Let's select my user for all the pull requests affecting these folders, right? If you want, to uh, use this particular user in all the pull requests, then you can leave this as blank. If you want this to be applied only a certain set of folders, then you can specify the path. Let's say apps and star, something like this, okay? And again, allow requester to approve their own changes. You don't want that. So once you've verified everything, you can hit save. Okay, so that's your uh, branch policy. Okay, let's go back to repository, select the repository and go to approvals and check. Scroll to the very right of the screen and you will see add your first check. So these are not, not but the checks that you can apply on your repositories. So hit over here, view all checks and you can select the check that you want. Um, this is nothing but the quality gates that you would want to add by default in all your pipelines branch control, evaluate artifact, require template, pre-check approvals, let's say uh, approval should grant approval for the deployment, right? And business are that your deployment should start in the specific time window. These are the policies that we are implementing on your code, right? You can specify all those checks 
and then hit next let's say select the business hours during which you would want your pipeline to be executed and hit create right so this is also an important uh, approval and checks to add in your pipeline all right so let's talk about authentication and authorization so if you go down uh, under pipeline section there is an option called service connection so you should always always use service connections to communicate with your azure portal services right pad should be used as the last resort that means your personal access tokens because while using personal access token a lot of things should be kept in mind like it should not have a wide access it should only have the restricted access and it should be renewed after a few days it should be revoked when compromised and there are a lot of other things that should be kept in mind and service connection should be used wherever possible so if you can do it create service connection when we were implementing it on the project we were creating it from the pipeline itself but this is the way how you should do it so you create on service connection and never use this option as your classic because i'll show you why let's say if you select this and hit next then it will be applied on your subscription right subscription id subscription name here you will provide your service connection and you grant the access to your pipeline its scope is really wide right you would not want that so let's go back and what you want is an azure resource manager service connection hit next and inside that you should use workload identity either workload identity federation automatic or the manual so these two should be used these two are the recommended ways you hit next now what you can do is you can select the subscription for which you would want to create the service connection and inside this you will restrict the scope to a particular resource group so that this service connection will only have access to that particular resource group and the resources inside that right and then you hit grant access permissions to all pipelines within that particular project and subscription resource group and the combination of those so this is what you should be using right if you already have a service principle then you can use the service principle over here hit next and then I, if it, it is a certificate, then you upload the certificate PEM file over here, tenant ID, service connection name and verify and save, right? But make sure, so, so service principles are to be created in Azure portal. And as a best practice, you should always have a separate service principle for separate team, like uh, one for developers, one for operations and so on, because they should have different level of access to the project. Right. So that is why a separate service project will always keep you safe. Okay. So the last topic is how you can store and access secrets. So there was a video in which I have, I'll, uh, I don't remember at this time, but I will share the link in the description. So in, in that video, I have discussed in detail, like how do we use secrets and credential data within your pipeline? So there are mostly three ways. There could be more than that, but I'm aware of these three ways. First is you tokenize your files in which you are using secret data, and then you replace those tokens while runtime variables. That's one way which I have shown as well. The another way is to use Azure Key Vault. So you store your secret data inside Azure Key Vault and then link that to your Azure pipeline with the help of variable groups. So that's the other way. The third way is to use a third party secret management service such as HashiCorp Vault. So you can use any of those ways and you should be good. So this is what we wanted to discuss. Uh, I believe this video was somewhat helpful. And if you like the video, if you found some value in that, so give it a thumbs up. And if you are new here, please subscribe the channel. Oh wait, uh, I just wanted to show you one more thing. For the next video, I wanted to, to do something different because we have covered almost all the topics within Azure DevOps that is there to know from a beginner's point of view. And we did actually uh, more than a beginner's point of view. We did beginner to intermediate level. Uh, but you want to do for the next video, I'll be covering all the issues that you have faced so far and what you have provided me over the comments or through the Discord channel. I will create a list of those and I will try to explain all those doubts and queries in the next videos so if you have not posted any query or comment till now what you can do is 
you can go to this website the cloudopscommunity.org this is our community website and if you go down to the section where there is a discord icon you can click on that or on the top where it says join us you can click on that this is absolutely free to join so click on this particular uh, discord icon okay so you will see a screen something like this if you are logging for the first time so you will be asked uh, some set of questions so you can uh, answer those and then you will be in the server so we have 2600 plus members so there is on the left side there is a dedicated uh, thread so there is this thread for help journal for any journal help right and then there's a dedicated help channel for azure devops series this one over here right so whatever questions you ask you ask let's say this one right if you click on that you go up so someone was facing this particular error here are the steps to reproduce expected results are this one and this is the error screenshot or any yaml pipeline code or anything that you can provide right so once you do that you tag at the rate helper role and someone from our community will help you in answering those questions right once that issue is resolved we will mark that thread as resolved right so all of these questions that you see over here related to Azure DevOps, I'm going to add those uh, in the next video plus from the YouTube comments and whatever you will be adding from now on, right? So the next video I'll be uh, publishing next week. So you have one week of time till then. Any question, any doubt you have till now in this Azure DevOps series, feel free to ask over here in the detail section or in the comment section, whichever way is preferable to you. But if you are facing any issues in implementing any project, so this would be the preferred method to reach out because over here you can share a lot of details like your pipeline code, error screenshots and a lot of other details which you cannot do in the comment section, right? This is absolutely free of cost. You don't have to pay anything. This is all by the community for the communities. Make sure you utilize this opportunity and take the benefit out of it. So thank you so much for watching once again I, I will see you soon next week with the next video and that's gonna be the last video of the series. So thank you so much for watching I will see you then and happy learning.